Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Reiterter, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I think you really enjoyed this one. I did, uh, performing it is very satisfying, uh, quite complex at times. Um, I just want to apologise for yesterday's video. For some reason the audio uh, did not upload. Uh, I think it was a rendering issue. I think I've temporarily fixed it for today. Uh, hopefully you're hearing me loud and clear. I had a patient who actually attended today and I was really keen to get this video uploaded um, tonight. I attended with bilateral fully occluding dry earwax. Um, the patient also has otitis externa of both ear canals. Otitis externa is an umbrella term for an infection or inflammation of the outer ear canal um, and the outer layer of the eardrum. So we're just performing the procedure on the left ear first. The patient felt this ear was the worst out of the two. And I'm just using a Zolna suction probe to tease out this very dry crumbly wax. You can see the patient has got um, otitis, ex uh, otitis externa, some eczema of the uh, lateral part of the ear canal. So it's some very dry flaky skin. Thus far, the Zolna suction probe is very effective. We're just beyond the second bend now, the ear canal, and I know it's the second bend because it's the bony part of the ear canal and there's no hair follicles, there's no cilia on this part of the ear canal. In addition, there's a narrowing uh, called the isthmus. So we, we all have two narrowings. Um, the first narrowing is roughly a centimeter into the ear canal and that's where the bony part of the ear canal meets the cartilage portion of the ear canal and the second narrowing is approximately half a centimetre away from the eardrum. Um, so the ear canal narrows and widens and it narrows and widens again. And this remaining plug of dead skin and wax is lodged within the second isthmus. There's a lot of dry skin adhered um, to the canal wall, which is also attaching to um, the ear wax. Dead skin in the ear acts like a double-sided sticky tape. It sticks to the ear canal wall and it also sticks to the earwax and sometimes it can be very difficult to um, elevate and retract the dead keratin skin both off the ear canal and also the earwax. So I'm just on the posterior canal wall, so the back part of the ear canal. You can see that layer of skin that I'm trying to peel off the canal wall. We have to be very gentle in this region of the ear canal. The outer third of the ear canal is made up of cartilage. So it's the outer third and the cartilage has a thick layer of skin that, well, thick in relatively compared to the thickness of the skin that lines the bony part of the ear canal. So the skin that lines the cartilage portion of the ear canal is roughly one millimeter in thickness. There is also some muscle underneath the skin and some fatty tissue. The inner two thirds of the ear canal is made up of bone and there's just a very thin layer of skin measuring 0.1 millimeter, so one tenth of the uh, thickness of the skin that bears the outer part of the ear canal. So it's very delicate. If we make contact the bony part of the ear canal, uh, the patient won't be happy. Um, apologies for not editing this black screen out. Um, must have been one that I missed. The ear, patient's ear canal is also a slightly narrow, which makes it a bit more difficult to manoeuvre the instrument once you're in the ear. So when we're trying to remove skin or even at wax, uh, any, any any region of the ear canal actually, we need some maneuverability of the instrument. Remember the ear canal itself, the diameter of the average ear canal is approximately between 0.7 and 0.9 millimeters. Um, so you can almost compare it to what well, similar to your little finger, or say even smaller than your little finger. And then you've got two bends, and there's a narrowing and opening, and then a second narrowing and opening. So it's very difficult. Um, orifice to operate in sometimes um, in some people's ears. See we're making very good progress now. This is the, I think this is the final plug of wax and keratin. You, can, you, you also can tell that the wax and keratin has been there for a while because it's oxidized. Fresh ear wax um, is usually a light brown shade. Fresh dead skin is actually white and over time the dead skin and wax oxidizes and it turns into a darker shade of brown and eventually it can also turn into a completely black shade or a completely black appearance and you know if it's black it's been there for a long long time so i've managed to extract this plug of wax out of the second 
narrowing. The second isthmus, which is around half a centimetre away from the eardrum, uh, but there is still, uh, it's, it's a bit tricky extracting this from the, the, the first bend. So I'm going to bring this forward and you can see this is the first narrowing, uh, the first isthmus, and it's getting trapped here. Really having to pull it through, extract it through. I was reluctant to put any drops in just to help because the patient um, had been using drops quite a lot. Um, not sure how well they've been using the drops because the wax is still relatively quite dry. There's some, there were some parts of the wax, more laterals near the entrance that was a bit more wet. That soaked and absorbed the drops. I'm just trying to rotate this wax upwards. So I'm going to roll it up and then roll it back down. I'm trying to squeeze it through, tease it through the second, well sorry, not the second narrowing, the first narrowing. You can see I'm going to the top of the plug of wax and trying to bring it down and just trying to wriggle. So I've just decided to use some forceps now. Just trying to get the jaws of the forceps either side. Uh, I've managed to move a little bit there. There's nothing more for me to grab onto now, so I'm going to have to go back in with the zonal suction probe. Can't use a hook or a Johnson horn at the, in here at, at that stage because there was no opening. To use an, an ear hook or a Johnson horn or correct, you need an opening to get in and behind the wax. There's nothing there available. Nonetheless, managed to remove it using suction. Just going to have a look inside the ear. I think there's some dry skin at the roof of the ear canal, but. Eardrum's amazing view of the eardrum. That's what's so great about an endoscope. The endoscope, it provides an unparalleled view of the whole ear canal and also eardrum. It's, it's, it's a panoramic view. For years as an audiologist, um, I used to use an otoscope. And an otoscope, I wouldn't, I've, I've still got my original otoscope I brought many years ago after I qualified, spent a lot of money on it. Haven't used it in around five or six years uh, because I would never go back to an otoscope. The view, it, it, you just, uh, I would have to um, make an effort to try and capture the view of an otoscope uh, or an, a microscope even, comparing it to an endoscope. It's just, uh, yeah, it, it was a game changer for me when I first started using an endoscope in my practice and we started developing the iClearscope. Now we're on to the right ear. This is this ear the patient felt wasn't as bad. He, the patient noticed after I cleared the left ear that this ear actually was bad, um, but when the patient attended, because the patient's comparing one ear to the other, uh, he felt the left ear was significantly worse and he wasn't really aware of a blockage in his right ear until I cleared the left ear and obviously the patient could notice the difference. This ear was actually a lot more challenging. Um, the ear canal was a bit more narrower, but the wax was a lot more dead. The, um, to the ear canal, uh, but you, but there's a lot more dry skin adhesions here. So it took a lot, lot longer to remove this. So just using a zonal suction probe, you can probably tell um, that the ear canal is a bit more slit, it's a bit more narrow. Um, everyone's ear canals are more, uh, you have got an oval appearance, like a rugby ball, or if in America, an American football. Um, so it's like kind of an elongated circle. But with this patient, that elongated Oval, it's, it's a lot more stretched. It's 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 from the width, it's narrower, but the length with the height is higher, and it's potentially one of the reasons why the patient's getting a build up. Um, it's the first time the patient's uh, attended here, but he did mention that on a yearly basis, normally he needed his wax removed, and I think it's been a couple of years, so he's way way overdue. So I'm just persevering at the moment with the zonal suction probe. Probably removed about a third up to half of the, the ear wax. So all the lateral wax near the entrance are removed. I'm just trying to pull this through the narrowing. So just like the left ear, uh, so this ear canal also has two narrowings. Uh, one about a centimetre into the ear canal and the second about half a centimetre away from the eardrum. So I've just tried to go with the forceps. But what the forceps actually does when I'm trying to get a grip, uh, it can also at the same time push some of the wax further in. So you've got to be very careful. We don't be pushing this wax further in and causing more of an impaction. So just removed a bit of dead keratin off that wax. It's very dry. So I've decided to use an ear hook. I have to get the right orientation. There's not much 
space in the ear canal because it's quite narrow. So the L band I've rotated so it's facing uh, upward superiorly to the roof and then once I'm in I'm t twisting this ear hook trying to embed it within the wax pulling it out. Unfortunately it's just dissecting it, it's not really helping much. So because I've dissected it, um, cut it into a small piece, I've just gone back in with the zonal suction probes to see if I can wriggle it out. You can see I'm really tugging at this. Um, it is, some of the um, dry skin and wax is, is coming, it's separating from the main body. So that there that I'm suctioning, it's not actually wax, it may look like wax, but it's dead skin, it's dead keratin. You can see the ribbons actually of dead keratin uh, that shedded the different layers. You can probably see it, you, you'll see this the ribbons of this dead skin and it's all coiled around this wax. So there is wax there in the, in the core, in the centre, but around it you've got keratin. So I've decided to use a Jobson horn, not much space. A Jobson horn, the surface area is a lot wider than an ear hook. I can just about insert it and I've got a little bit of this dry wax out but not a lot but it was, it was not possible to get that jobs and horn, horn any further um, than what I did there so just using the forceps again you can just it. <coughs> there was a bit of an opening there on the, on the anterior canal wall and just managed to pull some dead keratin out There's another sheet of keratin. Unfortunately, each ribbon of dead skin and um, keratin is it's removing one layer at a time. Ideally, with the forceps, you just and with the Jobson horn and also with the ear hook earlier, you wanted to extract a big solid mass of dead keratin wax out in one go. But in this case, it wasn't to be. So I'm just persevering again with some suction, and you can see you got a bigger piece of keratin at the top. I think this video is great to illustrate that sometimes the instrument you think is the best instrument actually in practice is not and quite often we have to use a combination of instruments in conjunction with, with each other, they all support each other. When I first got trained in doing clinical ear care I was only trained in um, microsuction uh, so uh, it was only when I decided to develop the eye clear scope um, so just a bit of background uh, first got trained, so audiologists in the UK don't get trained to remove earwax as part of their core training. I think that's true to say with most audiologists around the world. Uh, it's, a, it's an additional skill that audiologists over the last decade or so have uh, acquired and it makes sense. Audiologists are the best people to remove wax because we are looking in people's ears day in day out, it's what we do. And in the UK, the last decade has been a big surge. So most, I would say, well, I would say probably about fifty to sixty percent of audiologists are now trained in wax removal. And I initially got trained using um, some head loops. Um, head loops are similar to like magnifying goggles, essentially. It's what dentists sometimes use um, to examine inside of your mouth. However. If you've got earwax near the entrance of the ear canal, head loops are fine, um, you've got an adequate view. However, if the wax is deep in the ear, you, you simply don't get the depth, you, you don't get the magnification, and it's just not safe, I don't feel, um, to remove, or at least with the head loops that I had, I really struggled, and I thought what a lot of people did, and that's what inspired me to uh, develop something else. And, in the UK, uh, all the ENT doctors um, in secondary care, they use an operating microscope. An operating microscope is a huge piece of equipment. It weighs a ton. Uh, it's not portable. And with an operating microscope, although the view is very magnified, um, and you do get uh, really good depth perception because you, you're using both eyes to, to look and converge inside the ear canal, so that provides you with 
uh, depth perception. It's what we call stereoscopic or binocular vision. So if you're working very close to the eardrum, it, you, you've got really good depth. The, the view was very narrow. You don't see the whole ear canal. And as soon as you move the patient or the patient moves or you move the microscope slightly, you lose focus. Um, and that's the same with head loops. You lose focus very quickly. So I spoke to my colleague, Mr. Darish Rajali. Uh, we've been we're colleagues, but we've been friends for a number of years now. And I said, there must be something that we can do, um, something different. And endoscopic ear surgery has been on the rise, uh, both in the UK but internationally over the last decade. And in fact, uh, most of the, the recently uh, qualified ENT consultants are now using endoscopic ear surgery all the time. Um, it's endoscopic ear surgery, I believe it started off in the Far East um, and in, in Asia. But it's never really taken off in this country until the last 10 years. But now, um, I think ENT, a lot of ENT doctors are realising that the, the major benefits of an endoscope as opposed to a microscope when performing ear surgery. And the, the main difference is that field of view. You can just see everything in, in one shot. It's just, it's just unparalleled. And um, so Mr. Rajali mentioned that to me and says, well, why not? Why don't we try an endoscope? And that, that's where the idea first stemmed from. And it took us about 18 months to develop the iClearscope. We had to get the correct length, the diameter, um, and also the optics. Um, some endoscopes, you look in the ear, and you, you, the eardrum's too magnified, and you don't get the field of view. Whereas other endoscopes, the field of view is too wide, so you're seeing too much of the ear canal. You're almost seeing behind you, but and then, which is great, but the side effect of that is that the eardrum is very deep in the distance. You don't get that depth perception. So it took us about 18 months to develop the correct optics for earwax removal, and the iClearscope has been specifically developed and manufactured for the sole purpose of um, earwax removal. So yeah, a bit of background there, guys. So. Just going back to the video, you can see I was using a variety of instruments, hooks, scoops, forceps, um, still quite difficult, but we're making some progress now. Um, you can see I've separated the plug of wax completely from the ear canal wall. You can see the bottom part of the ear canal completely. So I'm just trying to insert a hook underneath. Again, I'm just going to be very gentle. We don't make contact with the canal wall and I don't push this wax further forward. So I managed to dig into the, to the plug of wax. But at the core, the wax was quite soft and it just dissected it, it just sliced it, it didn't bring it forwards, which is a shame because that was quite, um, we managed to get in, get, get in the right position with the hook um, by going underneath. So there's a bit of a gap at the top, I just have to be really careful, I don't want to touch the, either the eardrum or the, the roof of the ear canal using the ear hook because that would be quite uncomfortable. And again, unfortunately, we're gliding forwards and it's just slicing through. Um, so we used a, some forceps, uh, not forceps, we used some uh, Johnson Horn earlier as well and was doing it, it was having a similar effect and the surface area of the Johnson Horn is too wide so you can't really go any deeper than we did before with it. Quite how this patient was hearing um, before, uh, yeah, it was, even the patient themselves was quite shocked after seeing all the contents of their ears on the tissue, which you'll see some really good still images at the end if you carry on watching. Uh, we also weighed the wax, it was over half a gram. So again, this wax is lodged in that second narrowing, the isthmus. You can see that tugging motion I'm using, going up and down, left and right, and just really releasing this wax. And that's the patient's eardrum. Fully visible, very healthy, lovely view again of the whole ear canal. It's just a fantastic view you get the eye clear scope. So I'm just going to go back in, just there's a bit of dry skin around the edge. So the patient has got some otitis externa, so I have recommended uh, the patient not to use uh, Cotton birds, uh, Q-tips, because the patient advised that they did because of the itch. And if you've got an itch and you scratch it uh, and you try to relieve it using a, a cotton swab, you're doing one of two things, you're, or, or both two things actually, not just one or two. Uh, you can be pushing the wax further into the ear canal and you, you can graze the outer layer of skin cells, uh, the epithelial skin cells. And they're important, these epithelial 
skin cells because these skin cells, as they die and shed, they naturally migrate out of the ear in a conveyor belt motion. And that, as the skin migrates out of the ear, a bit like a snake skin, it also takes with it the earwax. So this skin is very, the epithelial skin cells are very important to the migration, natural migration of earwax. So that's all the contents. I think I've got three still images. And I've also got image of the wax on the scales as well. So that's a second still image. It's a bird's eye view. And so, yeah, so it's just under um, 600 milligrams, quite a haul. I'm still waiting for my first gram earwax removal. Um, hopefully, um, won't be, it won't elude me too much longer. But I hope you enjoyed that video, guys, and I'll speak to you all soon. Take care. Bye.